We always know we can take our pets to the vet when they need help. But where do our friends in the wild go? It's important that we take care of our outdoor buddies and the University of Illinois has a clinic to help them out. On this edition of the Paul Report, I'm talking with Dr. Sarah Reach and Adrian Coleman from the University of Illinois Wildlife Medical Clinic about their multifaceted program and how it benefits the animals and people in our area. The Paw Report on WEIU is supported by Rural King, America's farm and home store, livestock feed, farm equipment, pet supplies, and more. You can find your store and more information regarding Rural King at RuralKing.com. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Paw Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, Authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. Thanks for joining us for this episode of The Paul Report. You'll notice we are not at the studios of WEIU. We have gone on the road to the University of Illinois for a wonderful episode here at the Wildlife Medical Clinic. Thanks for joining us today. We have Sarah Reach and we have Adrian Coleman with the clinic here to talk about all their wonderful clients, their new space that they have moved into, and all the other great and neat stuff that you do here at the Wildlife Clinic. So thank you both for joining us. Yeah, thank Thanks you for, for having us. Yeah, well, we'll start with, uh, why don't you both tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what you do here at the clinic. Adrian? Sure. Yeah, so I am uh, a um, lead avian trainer, so I help train the uh, students and all of our volunteers on how to handle and train and uh, care for all the resident animals that we have at our facility, which is now um, up to nine. So we have quite a few critters to care for day yes. in and day out. And you brought some critters with <laughs> yes. you today. Yeah, we did. We brought some of our friends. So these are our wildlife ambassadors, as they're, they're named. And we brought them here. We have uh, Derby over here, our Eastern Screech Owl, Odin, our uh, red-tailed hawk. And I have an American kestrel, thistle, and we have our eastern <laughs> box turtle, hazel. I love that you name them all. That's, mm -hmm. that's great. And they're just like your pets. You just handle them like they're, you know, your buddies. That's, that's really neat. Sarah, tell us a little bit about yeah. you and uh, mm -hmm. your role here at the clinic. Yeah, so, um, so I act as medical director here. Um, so basically, I am in charge of the veterinary care for both our wildlife patients and then for these little critters right here on our outreach team. So um, I get to kind of work a lot with the... Um, teaching hospital as well as with our student volunteers. How long has the clinic been around? Yeah, so we were founded in 1978. Um, so we were actually coming up on our 40th anniversary, which is quite a big deal for us. Um, and the nice thing is we went from just a handful of uh, students, technicians, and a veterinarian to having over 100 volunteers, um, multiple veterinarians, a um, bunch of different specialists that work with us, as well as a big change in our facility. So we've come, we've come a long way. <laughs> Why was there a need for a, a, a medical center? Well, we started in a very small space, mm -hmm. just used a little section of the ER many, many moons mm -hmm. ago, and then they moved us uh, to the basement of the small animal clinic, and that had limitations on expansion. So it was a great space, and we still use it actually for our resident animals, but um, we do we definitely needed more space to expand, mm -hmm. and this facility is, is going to provide that yeah, for us. Yeah. And probably even expanding on that answer is the mission of uh, yeah. the wildlife clinic, and maybe that also explains why you do exist today. Yeah, exactly. So um, our mission is threefold. So obviously our first um, kind of branch is to provide medical care for sick, injured, and orphaned wildlife, um, native wildlife here to Illinois. And then um, our next branch is basically to provide training to students, both veterinary and undergraduate students, as well as veterinarians in the form of our residents and interns across the street. And then kind of our last area, and especially highlighted here with these critters, mm -hmm. is to provide outreach and education to the public and the local community. How yeah. has the, it, you mentioned the space and we're going to get into that a little bit more because that's the new and exciting mm -hmm. addition to your clinic that yeah. you've needed for a long time, but how has it evolved since the 70s, uh, the clinic, how has it changed, how has it grown, how has it evolved yeah. over time? Yeah, so I think, I mean, in space, in 
um, people. Um, so as Adrian said, we basically just started out in a very tiny portion of the hospital that wasn't designed for us at all. Um, but there was a need for, for veterinary care for these wildlife um, patients that the public saw that we saw. And so a very few devout people kind of started that out and then realizing that we needed more space we like she said moved down to the basement which was really two rooms again that weren't designed for us and we kind of adapted to our situation which is kind of the hallmark of wildlife medicine <laughs> is you adapt to whatever <laughs> whatever place you have um, and and then we started growing and so we grew to a hundred volunteers so so numerous students undergraduate veterinary um, technicians outside volunteers all sorts of people as well as the numbers of our our patients grew and so we started really outpacing um, the space that we had and so we really knew we needed to move, but it kind of, the timing and the space were really up in the air. So um, the university actually purchased the simulator building, which is the building we're in right now, um, a couple years ago. And it actually stayed vacant for quite some time because no one really had developed um, a purpose for it. And so um, after a while, the, the dean was like, someone has to move in here. And wildlife was like, yep. <laughs> yep, we will. <laughs> and so we moved into a temporary space for about nine months, which was t two, three times yeah, the space big. that we had down in the basement as we were developing, building, designing um, our very own space down the hall, which we moved into in April. Um, and it's, it's been great because it's specially designed by us and for, for the, the critters that we have. And it's the first time in 40 years that you've you've had more space. Yes. Your eyes light up when yeah. we talk about this this area. Um, take us on a tour, if you if you could. Tell us about the new additions, the new space, plans for the future yeah. that you, that you have here, oh, because yeah. we're going to be able to show our viewers uh -huh. some of the yeah. some of the areas. Yeah. Well, I can talk about the yeah. current space, and, and then Adrian the can talk about the future because <laughs> sure. I, I brought them around there right. before. Good. So, so our new <laughs> clinic, um, like I said, we got to design it, so we kind of knew exactly what needed to go into the space. And so our first area is kind of our office space, um, but it's not just that; it's where students can work on medical records. It's where they can um, round as a group and talk about the cases that they have in the clinic. Um, and then we have next to that are two kind of treatment rooms that we've subdivided, if you will, into an intensive care unit um, and a pharmacy. And then the next one over is our treatment area and our laboratory. So we can provide specialized care for some of the patients that are coming in um, with a critical need, if you will, as well as doing a lot of the, the lab and pharmacy stuff in-house instead of having to go over to the, the teaching hospital to do it. Um, excuse me. And then kind of our next section of the clinic is our holding area. And this is where it's kind of the most exciting because we were able to separate out different holding areas. Um, so we can actually separate baby animals from um, prey animals and predator animals and even have a quarantine area mm -hmm. if needed, which is something we never had in, in all of our other spaces um, is that really separation area, which is honestly quite necessary for the patients that we have to give them um, as, as much of a stress free areas possible because they don't want to be in captivity mm -hmm. honestly um, and then kind of behind that we have some larger run areas so for larger animals like our eagles our geese um, our pelican which we'll talk about maybe a little bit later um, things like that and then and then we have a whole nother side of things where this is what we've done so far but we have so many plans for the future yeah dr. Yeah. Coleman you're yeah excited about yeah it. very excited <laughs> so as I spoke of early we had the basement space and we still do for our resident animals so currently we have an opossum that lives down there and then when it, it's inclement weather the birds come in occasionally but most of the time they're out in a flight cage uh, on display between the buildings of the small animal clinic and the basic science building so ideally we would like to build um, a large facility that's displaying all of our animal ambassadors out here in the front of our new clinic which will be great because it's often hard for people to find us where we're at right now right. Um, and then it puts us closer to them so it's going to be a really nice new building that will be up front hopefully breaking ground mm -hmm. very soon very soon um, and so we will have all of the birds out and they will have an indoor space and an outdoor space uh, they will be able to come in at night and when it's inclement and so they can um, stay out pretty much on display 
display all the time so people can come by and see the birds when they choose to do so. Um, and then we'll even have a little... it's designed for them, Right, too. it's designed for them. So it, we have um, the space that they have now, while it's worked, we've outgrown it, especially with the eagle. She needs a lot larger of a space, so we're going to have it in a pool in there for her, which uh, will be, you know, sort of part of the structure mm -hmm. versus sort of bringing our little tubs in and mm -hmm. things like that. So she will have a much larger space, and they all could use a little larger space, right. a little larger conditions. And then our reptiles will also be in an indoor space at the end, and there'll be a stage, and we can do presentations out there as well. So we're really looking forward to the public being able to see our reptiles as well, and our, our now our solo mammal mm -hmm. opossum <laughs> that we've acquired that will be out soon for, for presentations. But um, So we're hoping that that way people can see us more. We're more of a presence, we're more of a, a visual presen um, presence on our campus versus and, being uh, hidden. Right. And yeah. this I'm assuming is going to absolutely help fulfill and, and keep your mission going. Yes. Right. I by, mean, ideally, I think we really want to turn this into an educational center. Yes. I mean, we're hoping that this building has a few mm -hmm. spaces that we can still uh, build into and, and they have some branches onto it. So it's definitely possible that someday we may be able to become sort of the pull up the school bus and we're the educational center yep. and we may even have a seating area for students to come in and learn and then see yeah. the windows and all of their animals out front. So that is the hope yeah. that we will become an educational Treat center. It like a dust yeah, exactly. Of going out into the public, having right, them come right. to us. What? Oh, tell me about the services here. What? What you do? Uh, you know, every day you're you're busy from sun up to sundown, yeah. and you know, <laughs> seven days a week it seems like with with your clients and your Definitely. your animals that you're caring for. Definitely. So. Um, <clears throat> Kind of, again, it can be broken up almost into that threefold mission. Um, but really, the, the biggest thing we do is obviously offer medical care to, to sick and injured wildlife. And so the public, um, Good Samaritans, can bring in any sick or injured wildlife or, or orphaned wildlife, native species, um, and bring them in for medical attention. And that medical attention can, prov can be anything from just some warmth and some food to um, imaging, so x-rays, ultrasound, CT even, um, to surgery, endoscopy. We have all sorts of options available to us because we are part of a teaching hospital. And the nice thing is the teaching hospital recognizes that we are offering some important services to the public and to the community. And so they're very supportive of, of some of the endeavors that we have. Um, and then also training the students and then doing the outreach because those are really services that we do provide. We, we provide that education to students that they may not get, sorry Hazel, um, <laughs> otherwise <laughs> even in other veterinary schools because it's, it's quite unique what we have here and then obviously offering some of that outreach education yeah. to, to the local community, um, really being able to tell them what we have, what they can do, what we can do, all sorts of things like that. You were gracious enough to yeah, I know it's it's a lot to bring the birds and the turtle and the owl with you today. You do help all kinds mm -hmm. of animals. Tell us about some of the patients um, that you have. I'm assuming the four here were patients at one time, mm -hmm. um, and you've integrated them into mm -hmm. your outreach program. But uh, some of the other clients that you have here. Um, boy, we've had a lot of interesting things coming <laughs> over the year. I mean, we've the stories on you know obviously on the social media feeds. We've had snowy owls, mm -hmm. and we've had one this year. We've had one previous years. But um, last summer we had an otter, which was mm -hmm. a lot of fun. And they're they're tricky. Uh, they can get out of almost anything, uh -huh. so they're kind of difficult to to treat and to house. But um, that otter did really well. Yep. Yeah. Um, and yeah. then you had yeah, this and then we year, had the pelican, yeah, was, um, which was it was quite. Um, a story because I was actually giving a lecture to the wildlife students and I happened to mention, because um, people keep telling me this, I happened to mention that we we very rarely get pelicans. Specifically those words came out of my mouth. Um, and within an hour <laughs> we had a pelican at the clinic. <laughs> the white pelican. The white yeah. pelican, yeah. Mm -hmm. So an American white pelican. Um, the brown ones stay mainly coastal. Um, these guys do actually have a flyway through Illinois, so people don't realize we do get pelicans here. Um, unfortunately, we, we got this one for some unfortunate reasons. So this one um, and five others actually were shot. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, the five others did pass away. This was the only survivor. Um, but thankfully, this one was brought to us. And um, after a fair amount of medical care um, that include treatment for both the gunshots and 
in for subsequent lead poisoning. Um, this guy did great, and we released him back out into the wild, which was awesome. Yeah. It was actually a story we covered. Yeah. That was <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> it was a happy ending. Yeah, it was life. great. And we don't always get that mm -hmm. happy ending, unfortunately, with, mm -hmm. with um, how much trauma sometimes these guys go through. But to be able to see that and to be able to share it with the community yeah. has been great. Yeah. What are the main issues that you see with the animals that are coming in? Is it is it human related? Is it environmental? Is it a mixture of both? You're both looking at each other like, yeah, we've, we've got a lot of cases. But. It's tricky, right? Yeah. Because it, it is usually human it's related. Us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's that's um, that's a big part of what we're doing is trying to. We love that our students and our volunteers get the education from the cases come in. We, we obviously love the program and we're going to keep it going for as long as we can. But any chance we get to prevent that animal from walking in the door, mm -hmm. we're going to take it. So we like to talk to people about, especially when we do outreach, about how they ended up with us and then also give them a takeaway on what they could have done um, to potentially prevent that animal from coming in. So say Odin was, um, he was in his first year, which most red-tailed hawks don't make it past their first year, a very small percentage make it through. And a lot of times that has to do with their inability to hunt well, but it's also because there are food shortages. So um, we'll say to students or the public when we go out that you know if you have a cat, leave it inside because when you have that cat out in the outdoors, it's taking away from the food supply that Odin here might um, you know, might yeah. eat. So we just try to spread that message a little bit, the things that we can do. Mm -hmm. And you see a lot of those injuries. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and I'd say, yeah, unfortunately, the biggest, the biggest reason we see them is us. And it's not always directly. Um, so like she said, cats and dogs, mm -hmm. that's an indirect cause from us. We are letting them outside. Um, we see a lot of window strikes. So again, it's not that we mean for things to happen, but these birds didn't evolve with windows. They didn't evolve with cars mm -hmm. out there. So they don't really know how to navigate kind of the urban environments that they have here. Um, and so we, we unfortunately see a, a quite a bit of those instances. Now, there are bits and pieces of things that we can do, like keeping our animals indoors, like actually designing some of your windows so um, birds can actually see them and they won't fly into them. Um, but then we do actually get a few, thankfully not a large number, of, of direct causes from us. So gunshot wounds, poisonings, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, that is, is quite sad um, and it's something that we do have to deal with and, and it's a good training opportunity for our students but it is some of the sadder cases that we see. Yeah. Speaking of students, you have a very uh, populous student volunteer mm -hmm. program yeah. which really helps this mission to go. But yeah. Tell me about the, the students yeah. that are involved in the clinic. Yeah, so I think our student, our, our volunteer program is kind of twofold, and I'll talk about kind of our clinic stuff and then, and then the outreach program. Um, but we take veterinary students, so in their first through third years, as well as undergraduate students here at the University of Illinois. Um, and even from their first year, they can choose to volunteer in the clinic. And so, um, like I said previously, we have about 100 student volunteers, and they are kind of subdivided into teams, usually eight to 10 teams that are then led by um, team leaders who are usually um, upperclassmen that have had a year or two of experience here in the clinic. Um, and, and when I say the clinic is student run, it, it truly is. And so when we get patients who come into the clinic, so um, a, a local a Good Samaritan drops off, um, say a bird of some sort, um, the teams actually will intake those patients. They will triage them, so provide them medical care, um, do all their kind of physical exam things. Um, and then they will develop diagnostic plans. They will develop medical plans. Um, they will bring them to x-rays, all sorts of things like that. And then they even get to be involved with the procedures on those animals and surgery. And so we really try to have them involved in every step of the process of treating these animals. Um, and I think that's very important because Veterinary care is veterinary care. It doesn't really matter if you're doing it on wild patients versus a dog versus a cat. The medicine is the same. And so these students here don't have to be interested in pursuing wildlife medicine or zoo medicine when they grow up. They can want to do dogs and cats. They can do horses. They can do whatever they want. But they get the best hands-on experience here um, that are, is going to benefit them kind of throughout their whole career, mm -hmm. which is really great. And you yeah. see it as a huge benefit as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, uh, we have also undergraduates all the way up to third-year students, and many of our volunteers are, are both involved in the medical side and ours. We, we do offer a program for some um, individuals that they would rather just work with our animals in the sense um, that they take care of them and they train them. And they when you talk about hands-on and they do everything, 
everything, it's the same on our end. They do everything. I mean, they're the ones cleaning the enclosures. They're the ones that are, are making up their meals and, and providing them with nutrition. So they're getting a lot in husbandry, a lot of skills there. They're getting a lot in behavior and, and training. And so it's really, um, it's not just learning how to go out in public and speak to people, which is actually a really mm -hmm. important part of veterinary yes. medicine, yes. Um, but it's also just getting this relationship, like you mentioned, we're very close to these animals because they take care of them day in and day out. So it takes a, a lot of dedicated mm -hmm. individuals to make it happen. So we have about 25 on our side. Yeah. What's your and favorite part of working with, <laughs> with the young minds? <laughs> um, I think, honestly, my favorite part is just seeing them grow. Yes. Um, so I think yeah. definitely when they come into the clinic, especially if they start as an undergraduate student or a first year mm -hmm. student, they don't have a lot of experience, which is fine. Um, sometimes we get people who come in who have never touched a bird or a reptile or something like that. And so they come in, um, thankfully, very open-minded and very mm -hmm. willing to learn and very passionate about what they do. And to see them go from that stage to being a second or a third year student and being able to run the show, basically, um, yeah. is is amazing to see. And it's, um, it's very rewarding, honestly, for us as the veterinarians who kind of are overseeing everything. It means we're doing something right. Yeah. <laughs> so they can kind of take over the show for us, I they, guess. They yeah. do. Yeah, it's great. They come up with their own ideas yep. and the new concepts, uh -huh. and it's just wonderful to see. Yeah. I mean, it's a really nice yeah. development process. You can yeah. see right in front of you. Yeah, it's amazing. Exactly. So I lived in the country for many years, <laughs> still do, and as I was walking the tree line, a fawn was right there. Uh -huh. I kind of panicked for a moment because I thought mommy had left the fawn. Uh -huh. I immediately get on the horn to my neighbor who's, you know, is a, a, a country woman who's been there all of her life and I said oh my gosh what should I do and she said leave it <gasps> yes. don't touch it mommy's not Great. far away advice to people uh, if they come across wildlife yeah. what should they do actually we had that exact story last week. I got a message from somebody that there was one in the lawn, and later on that day, they stayed patient. It was mm -hmm. a hot day, and they saw the mom, and they took the best picture of this baby running after the mom as she came into the yard. So it does happen like that, but yeah. we have a lot on the website. Yeah, so our website is great. Um, Perfect. And yeah. so, really, the nice thing about our website is, is we have a little tab up there mm -hmm. that says, what do you do if you find wildlife? And not only that, but then it subdivides it into different species, because it is going to be different depending on if you find um, a, a cottontail bunny or a bird or an opossum or something like that because in most instances just like the fawn you leave them there yeah. the adults know better they don't want to see us they don't want to be seen by us and so they're kind of hiding off in the peripheries or they're leaving for dinner or lunch or something like that they'll come back um, and so those are those situations are very different than the times where you actually do have an injured animal and so mm -hmm. so we want to obviously take in those injured and sick critters, but we want to give the young ones um, the best chance at survival, and that's usually with mom and dad. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. And really, we, when we go out for outreach, we do a lot of speaking with children, and we're always, you know, delivering that message mm -hmm. that leave it be leave where it. it's at, because um, children especially, you know, yes. if they were to go after a wild animal, that could cause an injury. So right. we really try to make right. sure that they're yeah. with an adult and that they can observe with the adult from a distance to make sure the animal is safe. Yeah. yeah. As we wrap up our, our visit here at the, at the Wildlife Clinic, we have a couple minutes left. Yeah. Uh, final words that we can give to our viewers out there if they do have questions. You mentioned the website. Um, there's a lot of valuable information there. Yeah. Maybe just a, uh, some advice or something that we can give to our viewers to leave them with about this wonderful clinic here. I just, I think it's um, it's a real blessing to have something like this in the community because it's just something that a lot of areas don't have, um, but it's really important for the general public just to kind of observe and know what's around them and how they can help improve the situation. Like I said, we want to keep our cases going, but anything mm -hmm. we can do to keep them from walking in the door, any help that they can give us in that area would be very, very, we'd be grateful yeah. for that, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So. Definitely. And then yeah. the reminder, too, that, that we are a non-for-profit organization. <laughs> yes. Um, so, <laughs> so our entire operating budget, so um, the medications, mm -hmm. the, the food, the um, supplies for the clinic um, comes from donations, grants, things like that. Um, and unfortunately, grants are 
becoming <laughs> fewer and far between. <laughs> um, Very hard and to get. so, yep. <laughs> and so we depend heavily on the public for donations mm -hmm. to actually provide mm -hmm. care. Um, and so we do have this lovely facility that the university helps us with, um, but really everything else we really have to fundraise for um, or accept donations um, with creators coming in. And so kind of the reminder that, that we provide this care basically free of charge, um, but, but any donations, small, large, does not matter, um, can really help us out a great deal. And Absolutely. they can actually see that, that kind of giving link both on our website and then our Facebook page, which we are very active on, <laughs> sharing kind of cases mm -hmm. um, and, and things that come through the clinic, um, they can always visit us there. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, Dr. Reach, Dr. Coleman, and all the wonderful <laughs> animals that you corralled up to be with us today, thank you for, for yeah. taking the time to share with You're us welcome. your story and also to, invi uh, to invite us into your wonderful new clinic that I can't wait to show the yeah. viewers. So okay. Thank you both Thanks for joining for us. Yes. Oh. And thank you for joining us for this episode of The Paul Report on the road at the University of Illinois at the Wildlife Clinic. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Kelly Goodwin. We'll see you next time. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Power Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. The Power Report on WEIU is supported by Rural King, America's farm and home store, livestock feed, farm equipment, pet supplies, and more. You can find your store and more information regarding Rural King at RuralKing.com. Additional support for the Paw Report on WEIU is brought to you by viewers like you. Thank you.